I want to start our discussion of modern art with the idea of cubism and what cubist paintings looked like, how they sort of came about, and how they're reflective of this period of time. We can really center the big cubism movement between 1908 and 1914, understanding that elements of cubism were there before and after. But if you want to talk about sort of the heyday of cubism, these are the dates we need to look at. And, and the two leading cubist artists of this period were Jorge Brock and Pablo Picasso. And cubism virtually revolutionized Western painting. Art, even the Impressionists and Post-Impressionists, had traditionally attempted to reconstruct a quote-unquote real world. Viewers expected to see a foreground and a background, but with cubism, they got none of these things. There are actually two different types of cubism. Analytical cubism did away with all of those traditional things that people had come to expect, background, foreground, particularly, and began to focus on and explore the geometric qualities of objects. And then synthetic cubism took this uh, the ideas of analytic cubism and added color, expressiveness, things like that. Um, so let's look at a very, very important cubist painting by Picasso. And this is sort of one of the landmark paintings of cubism. And notice as you move from this side of the painting, the left side as you're looking at it, to the right side of the painting, notice that the figure becomes more and more abstract. Um, and that you sort of move away from traditional perspective. And this idea over here, where you see every angle of the person's face, of the woman's face, all at the same time, as well as her body, you can see, is she facing forward or is she facing to the side? Well, she's doing both at the same time. All of this was very typical of, um, of cubism. This is a sculpture that is cubist um, that's in Chicago. It's also by Picasso. And this is a portrait um, of Daniel Henry Conweiler by Picasso. You can see somewhere deep in there a picture of a person. It's a fractured portrait. Um, the audience has to work here to tease the image out of this geometric cubist grid. This is the, a viol the violin by Jorge Brock. Again, heady, heady intellectual stuff. You have to work at it. Um, it's almost a problem to be solved or worked out. And notice that you see all the sides of the violin at one time. The front, the sides, the bottom, the back. There is no background. There is no foreground. And this is an example of synthetic cubism. Um, again, working with the geometric images, the geometric shapes, um, but yet color is added. I want to look at a picture um, by Kandinsky. Um, this isn't considered to be cubist, um, but more abstract in, true, in the true sense of the word. Um, Wassilo Kandinsky was very interested in color and very interested in abstraction. In 1910, he wrote a book called Concerning the Spiritual in Art. And in this book, he stated his art theories. And he believed that the inner mystical core of a human being is the source of the greatest art, not outside forms. And so he wanted to express his inner core. And as in this painting here, he often expressed what he believed to be the infinity and formlessness of the world. Hence, you get these circles. He's not trying to paint something that already exists. He's trying to paint something strictly from his own imagination. Another interesting art movement in this modern period is surrealism. And 
surrealism was greatly influenced by the work of the famous psychiatrist Sigmund Freud and his very famous work called The Interpretation of Dreams. Freud had a tremendous impact on modern art and modern literature. He argued that the deep unconscious, or our id, are elemental forces like love, hate, violence, and that the id, or our unconscious, is kept in check by our ego, which is our conscious self, and our superego, our cultural training, our mores, our customs, etc. So life is about the ego and the superego trying to keep a rein on the id. So for Freud, the way to get out at the id, or our, the deep subconscious of a human, is to analyze a human being's dreams. Because there, the ego and the superego have less control. So as a result, people began to look inward at the subconscious for answers that motivated human behavior. So the surrealist took these theories and applied them to art. And this is an example of a surrealist painting by one of the leading surrealists, a man by the name of Salvador Dali. And this is called Inventions of the Monsters. Dali wrote this explanation about this particular work. According to Nostradamus, who is a, a favorite, a famous rather, um, prophet, someone who predicted the future, the apparition of monsters is a presage of war. The canvas, this canvas was painted in the mountains of Simmering, which is just south of Vienna, a few months before the Anschluss, which was the annexation of Austria into the German Reich. And it has a prophetic character. The women horses represent the maternal river monsters. The flaming giraffe, the male cosmic apocalyptic monster. The angel cat is the divine heterosexual monster. The hourglass, the metaphysical monster. Gala and doll together, the sentimental monster. The little lonely blue dog is not a monster. So these are his comments about this particular um, painting. And again, it's that sense of trying to create in a painting the subconscious. Um, and whether that's fear of a coming apocalypse or whatever, um, clearly Dolly puts us in a very dreamlike state in this painting. Then you get a picture like this by Paul Clay called Around the Fish, and you can tell the date's a little bit later, 1926. And in Clay, you really see a combination of cubism, expressionism, and surrealism. A dreamlike quality, cylindrical forms, floating shapes, colors, clearly something like Kandinsky that's coming out of his own imagination. You have the geometric shapes of cubism, and clearly it's sort of a dreamlike story he's telling here. So all of these types of art were very popular during the modern movement, and you can see they're really breaking away from traditional concepts of what art should be and what art should look like. Um, Though art has changed as we've moved through this course, um, the changes have not been in um, very s stark ways until now. We've had backgrounds and we've had foregrounds. We've had um, paintings of actual objects that exist. Now as we move into modern art, we see um, a fracturing of that. We see changes. We see a lack of a background or a foreground. We see no center. We see um, pure works of imagination and dreamlike states. So we're, we're really entering new and different territory here. The last um, art movement during this period I want to talk about is called Dadaism. 
And Dadaism, it was basically a protest movement against the war. It was intended to be irreverent and unorthodox. Dada itself is a nonsense word. It's totally made up. So um, the Dadaist manifesto um, called for the destruction of manners, the abolition of logic, the destruction of memory, and the elevation of the spontaneous. Ultimately, Dadaism was a symptomatic movement. It responded to the times, but it offered no real solutions. This spoof, Marcel Duchamp's spoof of the Mona Lisa here, um, is a classic Dadaist piece. So by putting the mustache and the beard on the Mona Lisa, you can see there that he is destroying, that he is abolishing, um, and elevating the spontaneous. Everything, you know, how many people probably thought, cough, I could just put a mustache on the Mona Lisa, right? Um, so this is what the Dadaists did, um, and it sort of made fun of and called into question um, serious um, ideas of manners, propriety, um, orthodoxy, if you will. <laughs>